This video is an overview of the basics of DNA and gel electrophoresis, which is the way that we analyze DNA in a laboratory. Um, so DNA is deoxyribose nucleic acid. Um, this is a polymer. Um, the monomer that it's made up of is nucleotide, so it's important that you know that. Um, so if we have a bunch of nucleotides put together, um, this will make up DNA. Um, and DNA is a double helix. So we have two strands of DNA that are twisted around each other. Um, and in the middle, um, the interaction is a base pair. Okay, and you'll see that adenine pairs with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine. Okay. Um, now the nucleotide is not just made up of the nitrogenous base with the ATGC. Um, it also has a phosphate and a sugar. So in the case of DNA, this is a deoxyribose sugar. Um, and the nitrogenous bases connect the two strands together in the middle. Um, so we have a picture here that's just kind of a model of how um, the bases are put together and what the uh, nucleotides look like. Um, if we were to actually draw in the molecules, you'll see here that it's a lot more complicated. Okay, so we represent this phosphate group with just a circle over here. And then we have our five carbon sugar here, okay, which we'll just draw as a five carbon shape here. And then um, the bases, depending on um, which base you're talking about, this molecule is going to look different. Okay, but we um, just simplify it by just putting a box. Okay. All right. So um, we have purines and pyrimidines for our bases. So the way that I remember pyrimidines is that pyrimidine has a Y in it. Okay, and so do the bases that are pyrimidines. So thymine and cytosine, okay, those are going to be our pyrimidines. And then um, you just know that purines are going to be the opposite, adenine and guanine. Um, so um, we also have ways of remembering which ones have one ring and which ones have two rings. So purines... So pure sounds like maybe like an angel, and angels have two wings. And notice that the purines have two rings. Okay, and then pyrimidines would just be one ring. So that would be um, a way just to help you remember those. So pure sounds like an angel, something, something that is pure. It would have two wings, so those have two rings. And then to remember which bases are purines versus pyrimidines, I just remember that the pyrimidines are the ones that have Y in them, thymine and cytosine. And then um, you just, I don't really have a good way of memorizing these, so you just got to know them, that um, G pairs with C, and there's three hydrogen bonds. So I have the actual molecule here, so you can see that there's one, two, three hydrogen bonds. You do not know how to, you don't need to know how to draw these structures, though. And then adenine and thymine have one, two hydrogen bonds. Okay, so G to C is three, A to T is two. So maybe you can think about it as the G to C rhymes with three, um, A to T, uh, two starts with a T, that might work. Okay, so um, how do scientists isolate DNA in order to study it? Um, so we did a lab with this where we isolated DNA from our cheek cells and from a strawberry. Um, and you just need to know that um, we can use a soap solution to disrupt the um, cell membrane. And then we use alcohol to separate the DNA from uh, the rest of the cell. How does DNA differ from person to person? So actually, not very much. So the difference between different people's DNA is only about 0.1%. And we get those differences based on the difference in the sequence of bases. So the majority of our bases, um, since DNA codes for protein, are going to be the same because for the most part we need to do all the same things in our body. Um, and then there's just 
a slight difference between sequences that will attribute to um, physical traits like eye color, hair color, and things like that. So how can tools of molecular biology be used to compare the DNA of two individuals? So um, this is where we use tools to run gel electrophoresis. Um, so the first important thing we need to know about is restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes are going to be enzymes, and they're actually extracted from bacteria, that recognize a sequence. and cut the DNA at that sequence. So for example, um, in the PBS class, um, when we're analyzing the DNA at the crime scene, we work with um, HE3, which recognizes uh, this sequence, okay, and it cuts in between those. All right, so anywhere we see that, or CCGG, the complementary sequence, um, we would cut there. So also notice, um, since we talked about on the last slide that A pairs with T and G pairs with C, you can see the base pairs here, A with T, T goes with A, G goes with C, and so on. So each one of those is a base pair. So if you know the, um, sequence for one strand, you can find the second strand. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of skim through this and figure out where um, the restriction enzyme would recognize the sequence and cut. So anytime I see GGCC, I'm going to cut the DNA. I'm just skimming through it right now. So here I see GGCC, so a cut right there. You find out in the human body systems class, it doesn't always cut so nice and neatly, but we'll keep it simple for right now. Hopefully I got all of the cuts there. So anytime you see that sequence, the restriction enzyme would cut the DNA. Um, so next question, what are restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RFLPs? For short, so I'll write in a different color now. Um, these are the fragments. So once restriction enzyme has cut, the fragments. RFLPs. Okay, so if we were to run DNA without um, performing a restriction enzyme digest, um, we would just have one fragment. We want to be able to separate it based on the differences in the sequences. So um, in this case, um, you can see that we cut the DNA one, two times, but this would result in three RFLPs. Okay, this would give us an RFLP. Here's another RFLP, and here is our third one. Okay, so if I were to ask you how many times the restriction enzyme cut this DNA, the answer would be two, but if I ask you how many restriction fragment length polymorphisms are produced, that would be three, okay, because once it makes those three cut, or two cuts, we would produce three fragments. Okay, um, so again, uh, just to recap from the last slide, restriction enzymes are used to cut the DNA into different sized fragments. Um, that's determined by the sequence. So if pe two people have a slightly different sequence of DNA, they're gonna produce um, different sized fragments. And this DNA is gonna be run on a gel to separate the fragments and determine the length. Um, and then we'll be able to look at the results of the DNA um, once we've run it using gel electrophoresis. So um, in order to figure out where fragments would be produced, um, we would have to count the number of base pairs. Okay, so here's one base pair, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. Okay, so this fragment is 25 base pairs long. Okay, I'm not going to do all of this fragment, um, but you could count the base pairs for each segment and figure out where it's going to line up on the gel electrophoresis. So we're going to load the G DNA into the well. Okay, so we put it in there. And we're going to run um, an electrical current, and it's going to cause the DNA to move down the gel. Right, and it's going to separate by the size of the fragments. Now, it's going to be moving down this gel because DNA is negatively charged. Should have pointed that out on a previous slide. Um, so, it's going to be repulsed by this negative electrode and it's going to be attracted to the positive electrode um, down at the bottom. Okay, so moves down. So this one that's 25 base pairs long, it would probably land, let's see, that one's 26, so it'd be somewhere right before 26. Okay, so we would actually see a band for that one. Okay, um, let's do one more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty. This one's 20 base pairs long. So it produces a fragment down here where it's at 20, okay, and so on. And we're going to have um, the smaller fragments are going to move faster. And they move further. So if you think about um, the DNA marker here as kind of like the y-axis of a graph, you'll notice that the smaller numbers are down here and the larger numbers are up here. Um, a smaller DNA fragment is literally going to be able to move faster through the gel because it is smaller. If it's larger, it's going to be harder for it to move through the gel, okay? And so I'll make a note of that. Larger, move slower, and not as far. Okay, so what this um, gel is going to tell us is not what the sequence of the DNA is. It does not, all, all, the only thing that we can see is bands on it um, that tell us the number of base pairs. So it can tell us the um, number of fragments, the number of RFLPs, and about how large those fragments are. So um, how can we look at the results and interpret them? So um, here is an example from um, the crime scene lab in PBS. And you'll see that we ran the DNA at the crime scene and we compared that DNA to um, different suspects, different people involved. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about where the smallest fragments are. So the smallest fragment would be the ones that move fastest and furthest through the gel. So if you look down here, okay, this would be our smallest fragment. Let's circle that actually. Okay, and it's measuring at about six base pairs, okay, based on this. Um, and that one would have moved the fastest through the gel. And our largest fragment is up here. Okay, and it looks like maybe, so it's between 70 and 60, so maybe that's about mm, 65, 66 base pairs long. Okay, um, something else I could ask you um, would be um, how many RFLPs at the crime scene? For the crime scene DNA, how many fragments did that produce when we treated it with the restriction enzyme? And you'll see we have one, two, three, for five RFLPs, okay, um, as opposed to um, Alex Garcia's DNA produced one, two, three, four. We have one, two, three RFLPs for Doug, and so on. 
So what we're typically doing is trying to figure out um, whose DNA was found, or if sometimes we'll use this for genetic analysis. So in this case, if I were to ask um, whose DNA was found at the crime scene, we would compare the number of RFLPs and the size of those um, to these suspects. So the DNA found at the crime scene had five RFLPs. One was around um, 30 something, maybe like 31, 32 base pairs long. And this one would maybe be, I don't know, let's call it like 26, maybe 23, uh, maybe around 12 and 10 base pairs long. Okay, and that looks just like Anna Garcia's DNA. She has the same number of RFLPs. She has five RFLPs, and they're all about the same length as the DNA found at the crime scene. Okay, so I would say um, the DNA found at the crime scene belongs to Anna Garcia because both the DNA at the crime scene and the, Anna's DNA um, produced five RFLPs at about 32 base pairs, 27, 23, 12, and 10, when treated with the restriction enzyme. Okay, and we noticed that there are some bands um, that are similar for some of the other suspects, but not all of the same RFLPs. Okay, so I actually already kind of went over this previously, forgot about this slide. <laughs> so <laughs> DNA runs through the gel, it's propelled by an electrical current. So DNA is negatively charged, so it's gonna move towards the positive end um, because negative and positive attract. Smaller fragments move farther and um, faster, larger are gonna move slower and um, not go as far through the gel, all right? Um, so that is just a recap of DNA and gel electrophoresis.